Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Please join me in welcoming our television and webcast viewers. My name is Fred Mifflin, President of the Canadian Club of Toronto. Viewers, we're very pleased that you're participating with us today. For 120 years, the Canadian Club has been proud to provide a forum for leaders in every aspect of society to share their ideas with us and to challenge our thinking. We're committed to providing a welcoming venue for discussion and debate on issues that impact our daily lives. Through our programs and activities, we offer access to dynamic public business and public leaders from around the world. Our guest speaker today is a great example. Before I formally introduce Zita Cobb, here's a snapshot of some of our upcoming events. On Wednesday, November 2nd, join us for breakfast at Facebook headquarters as John Ehrlichman, anchor of BNN and CTV National News, sits down with Jordan Banks, managing director of Facebook and Instagram Canada, to talk about how social media and disruptors are changing the way successful businesses go to market. And on Monday, November 7th, in partnership with the University of Waterloo's Faculty of the Environment, moderator and co-producer of Dream Girl, the documentary, Komal Minas takes the stage with panelists Debbie Fong of Yoga Tree and Susan MacArthur of Green Soil Investments to discuss the power of female entrepreneurs and what it takes to inspire the next generation of leaders. To order tickets or to learn more about the club, please visit our website at canadianclub.org. You can also join the conversation via Twitter and Instagram by following us at CDNCLUBTO. I want to thank the youth and young leaders with us today who are sponsored by the Murray Frum Foundation, Isabel Bassett, Michael McMillan and Kathy Spool, and NR Store. Thank you for your support and thanks for joining us today. <clears throat> and now our guest speaker. The Canadian Social Entrepreneurship Foundation defines a social entrepreneur as an individual who brings innovative solutions to society's most pressing social problems. A social entrepreneur is ambitious and persistent and is committed to addressing major social issues and offering innovative solutions. So our guest today, Zita Cobb, is the quintessential social entrepreneur. Now, at this point, I have to declare my bias introducing Zita as a fellow Newfoundlander and Labradorian, something that I'm very proud of. Zita grew up on Fogo Island on the north coast of Newfoundland. She went on to a very successful career as a senior finance and strategy professional in the high-tech industry before pursuing her personal goals to dedicate her energies to philanthropic work in the communities she calls home. The recent Order of Canada recipient is not only being lauded for her commitment to her native community in Newfoundland and Labrador, her ideas and approaches are also being studied as role models for future social entrepreneurship, or as she calls it, community economics. Zita saw potential, not problems, in the collapse of the East Coast cod industry. Instead of abandoning ship, she set out to reinvent and reinvest in her community. She's parlayed her education, her business background, and international travel experience into developing long-term viable solutions to revitalize Fogo Island. The results have been transformative. Shorefast Foundation's most significant projects to date are the Fogo Island Inn, Fogo Island Arts, the Fogo Island Shop, Fogo Island Cod, and Fogo Island Snow Crab, which is served at some of Toronto's finest restaurants. We're pleased to have Annette Vercher in moderating today's discussion. Annette, a fellow East Coaster, is an officer of the Order of Canada for her leadership in the retail industry and for her long-standing commitment to corporate social responsibility. For a period of 15 years, Annette was instrumental in growing Home Depot Canada, both at home and internationally. She currently serves as the chair and CEO of NR Store. 
If you have any specific questions that you would like Annette to address to Zeta, please complete one of the Q&A cards which are on your tables and one of our volunteers will collect them. So at this point, I'm very proud to welcome Zeta and Annette to our stage. The Canadian Club of Toronto stage is yours. fun we're going to have. Zita? We definitely have a tilt to the east here We today. have a tilt to the east. <laughs> so I was born and raised in North Sydney, which some say is the capital of Newfoundland, because when people went to the mainland, they stopped in North Sydney, and I think half of the community are Newfoundlanders. But what fun it is to be here today with Zita and uh, talk about her story, um, her wonderful, wonderful journey. Uh, you've heard Fred introducing um, that relationship, but we're both islanders, um, uh, Zita and I, and, um, and come from a very uh, interesting and similar background. And, uh, but what we want to do today is talk, I think, a lot about inclusive capitalism, talk about, you know, this wonderful community economic success story that we have here in Canada and um, talk about how Zita got here. So Zita, if I can ask you the first question. You sometimes say that you have lived in three centuries. Can you talk a little bit about that? Just to be clear, I'm 58. <laughs> <laughs> Not 358. But, it, but it, it's true, I grew up off the northeast coast of Newfoundland on a little island that's far away from far away. I feel like I'm very far away from you people over there. Um, until I was 10, Fogo Island had very little contact with the mainland. And we had no running water, we had no electricity, my parents couldn't read and write, and every once in a while the ferry would run, but not so often. We were inshore fishing people, salt fish people, to be uh, more to the point about it. And it was a perfectly intact community. And we had no money. There was no, well, I don't know. The, the Bank of Nova Scotia came to Fogo Island, first of all, by boat. But I think they didn't make many trips because there really wasn't much money. And, and business was done through what's called a truck system. Yeah. Anyway, this to me felt like a, perfectly, uh, a perfect life until I was eight, between eight and 10, the worst of the 20th century arrived in the form of the industrialization of the fishery. Of, of, when, you know, in Newfoundland, when we say fish, we mean cod. If I want to say mackerel, I'll say mackerel. So within 30 years of the first factory dragger being built, the cod, which was one of the biggest populations of fish on the planet, was brought to the brink of ecological extinction. So you can imagine, overnight, everything we knew, everything my dad knew, was useless. And we really fell out of our own story. And I remember the hushed conversations in the night of my parents going, what's going to happen to us? Because at the time, there was a big resettlement in Newfoundland. So by now, I've lived through two centuries, which was the 19th century, the 20th century, and my career, I studied business. Annette and I, have in some ways, lived the same life. She started from farming, and I started from fishing um, to come here. In any event, my career was in fiber optics, and in, in specifically in wave division multiplexing, which was a really important part of enabling the digital revolution. And so those are the three centuries, and, and I think I'm really driven by this idea that we're not actually on the best path. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if you're not on the best path, you kind of need to take a few steps back. So, so given those three centuries, um, how has business changed over your years and, and the, your perspective changed in terms of how you look at business? The first time I realized that business sort of existed um, was during the collapse of the inshore fishery because we could see these monster draggers right there. If you went up on Tom Hart's Hill, which was behind our house, 
at a time that we ostensibly had a 12-mile fishing limit, you could see them. And my father used to say, like, what are they thinking? Like, what kind of a system would cause people to keep fishing until the fish are all gone? It just doesn't make any sense. So that was my first introduction to business. So I studied business for the specific purpose of trying to understand what happened. And really, in my first year of university, two incredible things happened. I read Small is Beautiful, <clears throat> mm -hmm. which uh, I know most of you, I'm looking at ages, maybe the young people here don't know it, but it was a seminal book. At the time, I thought, this is the most important book I've ever read. Mm -hmm. I still think it's the most important book I've ever read. And I had this realization one day, I, I, growing up in Fogo Island, I'd never seen a cauliflower, but I saw a cauliflower in Ottawa. And I had this realization that, wow, this is it. Fogo Island is a little florette. Yep. And Ottawa is a bigger florette, and I've since discovered there are even bigger florets again. And all these florets are all held together by the connective tissue, which is the stem. And the stem has a job. Its job is to bring nutrition to the florets. And it really struck me in my first year of university, what happened in 1968 when I was 10, is the stem became so self-serving, it forgot its job was to bring nutrition. And so I think about business as having a job. Yeah. And the job is to bring nutrition to the florets, and those florets are communities. And you know, we're all kind of tangled up together in this beautiful cauliflower, of which there's just one, I think. So um, you've made a lot of money. Even you've, de you've taken that money, and you've developed something extraordinary. Tell me about your personal relationship with money, Zita. Money's a funny thing. And I don't think that we human beings really understand our relationship with money. I mean, we don't hoard turnips. I can tell you that for a fact. We share turnips. But there's something about money that, well, it certainly makes me uncomfortable. I don't trust it. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's an intensely useful commodity. Um, but we need to be, I'm always very careful with it, with thinking about how close to let it come to me. I'm a fan of this young writer named Charles Eisenstein who has come up with this concept called sacred economics. So he talks about sacred capital. Sacred capital, things like human capital and social capital and cultural capital. You could even add spiritual capital. And then there's money, which is what we usually call capital. And, and this finding this right relationship between money, which is hugely important, mm -hmm. but not sacred, and sacred capital. And so I, I guess I always think in those kinds of intersections and how can the intersections be productive ones yeah. for yeah. the sacred. Yeah. So tell us what's so special about Fogo Island. Why, why is it important? Why, and why is it so successful? Tell us why this place that is in the, it's in the easternmost spot, I, I guess, in our country. Um, uh, it is, uh, you know, it is a magnificent, beautiful spot, but it's out in the middle of nowhere, really hard to get to, um, really hard place to build. Um, tell us why, what's so great about Fogo Island? I think what's so special about Fogo Island is not that it's special, but that it's specific. And I think human joy comes from specificity. And Fogo Island still is an intact community. It's one of Canada's oldest communities. Yeah. And people, I, I'm back to Schumacher for a minute. Nature, nature and culture are the two great garments of human life. Business and technology are the two great tools that can and should serve them. And so Fogo Island, as a small island, which Alan Doyle calls a salty Narnia, is, it's a really good proxy for a small planet. And the most important thing in any human life are, are relationships. And so, in, I mean, I'm an eighth-generation Fogo Islander, so obviously I have a lot of relationships on Fogo Island, and they go back centuries. And it is a place that you can experience, and I think as visitors, and I, you've been yeah, in it, so yeah, I know you know. Times, yeah. as, as a visitor, you can experience what it's like to be in an embodied relationship with a place, with a geography, with a people, with the people that are dead and gone. Mm -hmm. And so having this relationship with time, I think it kind of helps us get over ourselves. And I think small places are really great experiments. I actually think you know, life on the coast of Newfoundland has been a grand experiment for 400 years. It's a wonder we're still there. Um, but there's a lot to learn for the big florets from those little ones. Do you think that you could um, 
develop the Fogo Island concept throughout rural Canada? I think we could do this in Toronto too. Yes, we could. Yes. <laughs> and, I, and I think that the turn we're all trying to figure out how to make without it being catastrophic uh, or with a, as little catastrophe as possible because yeah. we're already facing catastrophe as human beings. I think we've created a pretty reasonable mess for ourselves mm -hmm. as it is. Um, yeah, I think the, the trick is how to use business to its potential because I think we haven't even begun. I mean, if you think about um, making money, well, mm -hmm. you know, there's lots of money in the world. Yeah. It's not always where we need it to be, but we're actually pretty good at making money. And if we could take the organizing power of business and actually turn it into the service of place and community and society, yeah. wow, we could solve all kinds of problems. Yeah. Yeah. And we could do it while wearing our business suits. Yeah. One of the, the great ironies I always think of from my working life is it always felt like we put on our suits during the day and we do certain things, and then at night we have to go home and change into a ball gown to raise money for something that we probably could have stayed home in our pajamas if we'd been different during the day. <laughs> and so I think it's about you know being... But business is such a delicious yeah, it tool. Is. And to me, it's super exciting to think about community economics and mm. how we can put it into service in a different way. It reminds me, Zita, of Mark Carney's speech in May of 2004, and he said, you know, encouraging enterprise and rewarding industrial initiative is essential uh, for economic progress, but social capital must be maintained for that progress to be sustained. And I think this is a big question that we need to be asking ourselves as business leaders, as leaders in this community, are we balancing uh, this, the, the challenges that we see in terms of globalization and seen in, in terms of community? I come from a very small community too. We relied on the coal mines and the steel plants. And the islanders are very industrious, they're very innovative. And I, I felt that some of that was taken away during, during the last century or so in Cape Breton. And I, too, believe that there's a renaissance happening there. There are a bunch of innovators and young people starting businesses and, and really seeing that they don't have to come to the big city. They don't have to come to another place. I think place is extraordinarily important. I love Ontario. I live here. I've lived here since I, since I was 30, 30 years old. But I belong to Cape Breton. I belong to the Maritimes. I can't, you can't get that out of me. And that's a place that I go back to because my family lives there. My community, your family lives in Fogo Island. It's really, really important to find ways in which we can allow our people to, to live in the places they want. Surely we have seen the lack of success in terms of how we've dealt with the indigenous communities in our country, trying to get them to other locations. It doesn't work. We have to spend our energy in defining places, finding ways in which we can develop them in their communities. So let me tell you about, I want to ask you about um, business thinkers and what you've learned along the way. What has influenced you particularly? Um, you talked a little bit about uh, Schumacher, I think, but tell us a little bit about that. Well, in my career, I worked uh, for a company from the very end of my career for about a dozen years called JDS Uniface. Yep. And the CEO of the company for most of my career was a man named Joseph Strauss, who yep. was um, a physicist, a uh, great Canadian, great business guy. He used to come in every morning and say, the most important thing is to keep the most important thing the most important thing. <laughs> and he will go on to say, and if you don't know what the most important thing is, maybe you should go home until you figure it out, because you're probably going to do more harm than you're yes. going to do good. And so in the technology business, the most important thing was the technology. Don't miss the next wave of technology. And so I th think when we are, whether it's Cape Breton or Newfoundland or Northern Canada or, tr or even Toronto, yeah. we sometimes lose track as human beings of the most important things. Mm -hmm. And so if you ask any person that I've ever met, love, beauty, respect, all yeah. those things we say, these are the things yeah. that are most important to us. But they're not easy to measure those things. No. And so they end up being put last. We're going to do that on the weekend. Yeah. And we, I don't think, have done the best job of organizing our lives or our business lives 
to optimize, to use a business term, for those things. Yeah. And so I think working with Joseph, learning don't lose your focus on the most important things yeah. and try to put everything else in service yeah. of, of that. Yeah. And, and I think to your point about small communities, life is a rhythm of opposites. And one of the great questions that I live with all the time is we, my dad used to say, nature knows everything. And we humans are so arrogant we don't pay enough attention. That's Nature right. knows to cure for cancer. We haven't figured it out yet. Yeah. And so what is it about us as human beings when we make human systems, they don't seem to naturally have the checks and balances or the golden mean of natural systems. Yeah. So we need to think deeply about that. And I, and I think as we get to be better business people, yeah. it's like we need a, a kind of a, a really higher level of conscious awareness of what are we doing mm -hmm. and who is it for mm -hmm. and what's it for. And what's it? So on the weekend when we were talking, we talked about investment versus development, right? And what does development mean in terms of, in terms of capitalism? I'd like to explore that a little bit with you. My dad could never figure out, I mean, he's been dead and gone for a long time, and so he had, he, he had no relationship with money, he never understood it, but um, he did have a bank account, which actually got like $100 in it. He had to go put his X yes. to make a withdrawal. But um, he couldn't ever understand, and no matter how hard I tried to explain it, he never got it, that someone could make their living by not working, yeah. but by making, like investing money. Yeah. So he never got the whole interest kind of idea. Yeah. And so I forgot the question that you asked me exactly. The, the but difference, difference between in, development but, and investment. Exactly. Yeah. So if you think about all the potential that lives in, in, a, in a human life, and every human life, there's potential. Um, I was reading the other day, you know, Warren Buffett can't figure out how to make any more returns. It's a yeah. struggle to get returns. Because his, his base like, wow. is so big. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and money, that's one quality of money. It's always looking for a return. But if you took some of that money, and invested it in the sacred. I mean, I don't know, maybe he could think about going to Detroit, which has a place of great potential, yeah. with, with lots of people that have potential and dreams that could be productive uh, yeah. members and citizens of society. It might not get a financial return, it would get a social return. Yeah. And, well, it might, and it would get a financial return, I think, over what time horizon? Yeah. I mean, that's the lovely thing about community businesses and this rhythm of opposites we're talking about. If someone's starting a little business on Fogo Island, like, it is not our intention to start a chain of hotels and inns and conquer the world. Like, this, making a relationship with the idea of enough. Yeah. And so if we can do enough to sustain our yeah. population and grow it, because we used to be 6,000, it's our great ambition to get back to 6,000 people. That's enough, that's pretty good. Then, then what we have to figure out how to do is hang on to it through the generations. Yeah. And so that kind of thinking would be development yeah. and is development. Exactly. Whereas if you, you know, have got $10 and you've set out to grow it into 20 yeah. as quickly as possible, that might be investment, but it's not development. Not, it can be development, it's not yeah. necessarily development. But you, you had a good year in Fogel Island? We did. Yes. It's, this is our fourth year, we're still measuring. And none of us, really knew what we were doing, and uh, we're, we're better now. We kind of know what we're doing. We will make money this year. Isn't that and great? the inn is, a, the structure of the inn, I'm super excited about the fact that Canada now has a registry of social enterprises. We have a definition of social enterprise as a nation, and that is super exciting. Mm -hmm. So we will make money this year as social business. The inn's a social business, fish business yep. is a social business, and that goes up to the, we operate it in a business trust yep. that goes back to the charity and stays in the community. Yeah. And so, Fogo Island is an exceptionally lucky place, part, partly because of art, yeah. because the National Film Board came to Fogo Island in that really slippery time in the late 60s, and started a project, which was really an art project, it was called, it's now called the Fogel Process. It was a participatory film project at a time that Joey, the then premier, was about to resettle us all. Uh, the NFB and Memorial University s stood in the wind with us and said, now just a second, before we all go rushing off to wherever we're rushing off to, let's understand what's happening here. And out of that process, which is asked questions in a different way, mm -hmm. brought people together in a very powerful way, 
um, a cooperative formed, which owns the fish business on Fogo Island to this day. All the fish plants are owned by a cooperative. And now we've put this other leg on the economy um, in the hospitality world, which is owned by the community. So I think not every business model yeah. is appropriate for every size of place, but yeah. for small places, I think local ownership of the capital, financial So you're capital, recycling essential. the capital in exactly. your community. Exactly. As opposed to going off to other places. Yeah. I read a, when I was starting into this, trying to understand this whole travel world, um, when we were on Fogo Island trying to figure out, can we do this? Like, do, do, do we have what it takes? And we kind of settled on a definition of hospitality, mm -hmm. which I have to say I did not experience in Toronto last night. Um, <laughs> and I'm serious. Yes. I was like, who would sell somebody a hotel room when that is over a construction site yeah. and not tell them? Yeah. That's not hospitality. Yeah. And, it's like, and I was saying to the, the lovely people here from Humber Hospitality Program, in the hospitality industry, we should be the leaders in yeah. business ethics because we're supposed to be taking care of people when they're sleeping. Yes. There's a lot of trust involved here. Yes. <laughs> so, That's great. Uh, anyway, so when we were getting started and thinking about hospitality, we settled on the definition that hospitality is the love of a stranger. Mm -hmm. And it is this such a sacred trust. Imagine, like, somebody lies down and trusts that you are making sure that nothing's going to happen to them mm -hmm. and are trusting you with their time to come this great... Mm -hmm. Uh, distance. Yep. See, I forgot the question you asked me again, Annette. No, I got no, so preoccupied I'm with last night. I'm talking about recycling. Re recycling, recycling money, yeah. exactly. And yeah. so, yes, I read this horrifying yes. statistic, uh, which was uh, of $100 spent by a traveler from the so-called developed world to the less developed world, $5 stayed in the local community. Yeah. It's like, wow, yeah. that's kind of crazy. Yeah. So then you have to ask the question, well, who are those businesses for? Yeah. What's the point? And so, of course, we set out to say, whatever dollar comes to Fogo Island, let's do our very best to so, hold on. So to how it. much of the money stays in Fogo Island? For the inn, it's 80%, yeah. 90%. Yeah. And, and, a, and then some gets out to Newfoundland. Yeah. That's not a bad thing either. So you run, <laughs> you run, you run fishery business, you run a furniture business. You run, uh, what else do you run yeah. there? We have three social businesses yeah. and Fogo Island Arts. Yeah. And, and we started with art. That's right. Yeah. Why art? Tell us a little bit about why art is just so important to, to your whole vision. Art is a way of knowing that is essential to being able to engage with all of our humanity, all of our ways of knowing. I think in the business world, we are trained as business people to be narrow, Thank you. you know, to be, to be too narrow sometimes. And you know, this the greatest Schumacher sentence is, every human being should get up in the morning, look at the world, and try to see it as whole. I didn't learn that in business school, yeah. but we should be learning that in business school because yeah. we would be different. We have this, this idea that we want to get out in the world, and we do it for our own businesses. It's called economic nutrition yeah. labeling. Yep. So, you know, we talk about externalities and all of the consequences of some mm -hmm. of our business activities. I think this is a way to get at this directly. So for, if you buy something from the Fogo Island shop, we make furniture. We sort of accidentally got into the furniture business. It comes with a label that tells you where the money went. If you spent $1,000 for something, it just, it mimics the food labeling. Remember when, you know, well, I remember when we didn't have food labeling, but now you can, you know, look at that box of breakfast cereal and think, oh, maybe I shouldn't have the second one. Perhaps I shouldn't have had the first one because the information is there. So do the same thing. For every purchase, you can see where the money goes, how much went to labor, how much went to expenses, how much went to overhead, whatever, how much went to profit. Profit's not a bad thing. Financial mm -hmm. capital deserves mm -hmm. and needs a return as yep. well. It's a question of how much. And then we show at the bottom, the geography, where did the money go? Yeah. Neat. So you were, you know, until you did this, you were in the digital business. The digital business, uh, you know, the premise is that it's gonna cause a lot of unemployment. They're, you know, the, 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 uh, the, 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 the jobs of the past are, are changing. And uh, what, tell me, you know, tell me, is there an alternative? And, you know, your example of, of what you're doing on Fogo Island, do you see that as part of the alternative? It's, this is the biggest sort of quandary, I think, of our times. 
we seem to have more people on the planet than we need because of, to work. And so, as my dad would say, what are we going to do with them all? Throw them all overboard? I mean, you, what are we going to do with it. us all? Yeah. And I think the promise of the digital age yeah. was it would enable more peer-to-peer -peer commerce. You know, I could be making something over here and selling it to you over there, and, and it would enable the more, more exchange. But I think what's happened is it's really become controlled by these so-called platform monopolies, which have actually caused, I think they've caused a disorder mm -hmm. of the connective tissue mm -hmm. of the STEM. Mm -hmm. And so I think that it's, again, we need to step back from how we're using the digital world. And I mean, it's a tool that we invented it, but we actually don't know how to properly use it yet. Yeah. But I don't think the natural consequence of the digital age is unemployment. No. I think if we get a grip of the tool and really use it for peer-to-peer -peer exchange, right. it won't have that consequence. And are you talking about the introduction of way more sustainability and how we're running our, in our enterprises, how our, our governments are run? Are you, do you see a movement in that direction or do you see us not quite getting there yet? I think the spirit of the change that has to happen has already arrived. I yeah. think we all feel it in our bones and know it in our hearts. Yeah. Stanislav Lech had this great sentence that every snowflake in an avalanche pleads not guilty. Yeah. We're caught up in this growth trap that's not so easy to get out of. And we're all perpetrators of yeah. that. And we're all victims of that yeah. as well. Is that because it's easier to calculate. It's easier to understand and see what a number tells you versus the value or, or benefit or cost you put on society. I mean, is that one of the big problems we have? I, for sure. I think we trust our brains too much. I mean, because a brain is only a small part of our ways of knowing. Yeah. And our brains overfocus on things we can measure. Yeah. And we can measure how much I have yeah. compared to how much you, you have. have. Yeah. And we, forget, we, we take for granted that the, fab, the social fabric is going to be there for us. Yeah. But then, you know, I, I think as those of us that have more, it's very easy uh, for us to become, because I think this is another thing about the human relationship with money, I think it actually causes anxiety. Mm -hmm. And it causes a kind of detachment. Yeah. And so, you know, we need to be very careful that we haven't, don't create a world that's filled up with, you know, f you know people who are financially advantaged that are global operators. I mean, yeah. this is the other thing that's so interesting that our relationship, we are embodied creatures. And so the most local place we live is in our own body. Yeah. We need an attachment to, to place. And I don't yeah. mean even national, I mean just geography, a yeah. rock in my case, or yeah. a farm in your case. Yeah. And everybody, I think everybody, every Canadian, if you scratch the skin, I think you'll find some place that makes their heart beat a little faster. Yeah. Um, because I think that's a part of what defines us as being attached to geography. Yeah. And we are now trying to navigate the, when you think about I mean, any old fashioned way of thinking about business, what are the inputs to yeah. use instruments? I mean, I think what we have to try and find is a kind of existential economics as opposed yeah. to instrumental economics. And I think we can do it. Yeah. It takes art to help us. But when you think about labor, capital, land, well, one of those three is infinitely mobile mm -hmm. and unbounded. Mm -hmm. So we need to be really thoughtful about the relationship right. among the three. Back to, back to Mark Kearney's comments, right, in, the, in that speech. I think that, that, that that's so critical. You know, um, I think uh, proud opening the New York Times, if anybody read the New York Times on Sunday, and the front page is a story about a Syrian family that came to Canada. And you read the Wall Street Journal, journal a few days ago, September 17th, uh, talking about maybe uh, some countries can get their immigration strategies right. We have a country that is has such a great foundation, is, is such a great community of people. Um, what you're trying to do is, is dig deeper and make it happen through, through social enterprise 
I don't even know if it's social enterprise. It's just business. It's, business it's is business. Business is should be. I mean, someone asked yeah. me the other day, do you think that yeah. business is reconcilable yeah. with wholeness? Yeah, so, I, absolutely. Yeah. I, do. I so do I. I mean, yeah. I, I I ran Home Depot and 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 I I just saw all the things that we could do as a company to really make a difference to sustain, you know, and give back to the landfill sites to the. I mean, we just look through this as a filter. How do you how do you how do you keep your employees happy? I think these are all things that enterprise has such an opportunity to do. I really do. Well, gonna, somebody has to give up something. But someone's got to give up something. That's, we got to give up. I've got to give up something. Exactly. I mean, I, I I am really lucky person. I did way better than I ever thought that I could do, and you too. And and I think part of that is recognizing that you've got to give back. Um, but in a holistic way, you know, and I think that that's... I mean, that's the other interesting thing we haven't talked about in much detail is the whole idea of charity. You know, charity is important. It's been yeah. with us as long since the dawn of time, yeah. and there seem, it's always that somebody doesn't have enough to eat. But in and of itself, it's not sustainable. No. It's not... No, I've never met a person that wants to be the recipient of charity, no. at least not for a very long period of time. No. And so... How can we use the, all the money that's caught up in various charitable yeah. places yeah. And, and get it actually working in business-like ways yeah. that helps develop exactly. communities? Exactly. I'm um, going to a couple of questions from the floor. Governments are very focused on big business. What should governments uh, be doing to champion small and community business? I think it, well, I mean, just this getting this registry for social business, I'll tell you, is, yep. is a huge thing because it's what a con legal set of contortions you had to go through to operate a social business because it's not, none of our systems are set up for it. Mm -hmm. I mean, always the things around making things, like there was a woman on Fogelman that wanted to start a bakery and she yeah. wanted to get registered and was like, oh my God, you know, the paperwork and the this and the that. Was, there's got to be a way to just make that Simpler, simpler and reporting simpler yeah. and 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 helping people see that every person can be a business person yeah, right. it's not just for people that have suits like you and me yeah yeah exactly and and so i think that kind so governments of could, ma could create it, that environment reduce the bureaucracy adjust their s systematic bureaucratic approaches yeah. like uh, create an open a place that is easier to play in that yeah. isn't yeah. so closely monitored and regulated. Yeah. And what's the worst that could happen? Yeah. I mean, one person might do something they shouldn't do, and but all the rest of the people are going to do really good things. It'll yeah. offset it. It'll offset it. Absolutely will. Um, you keep harping on place and the importance of place. Tell me, you know, this, this thing is so important to you. Why is that? If you were born in uh, Cape Dorset, would you feel the same way? I think that our human relationship with place, all of the places that in, in our lives we come into contact with in intimate ways are really important because it's our primary relationship. Because we are embodied, I think our confidence comes from that. Whether you love the place, not everybody is born where they feel they belong or want to belong. Nonetheless, that's a relationship. Who we are, like, we are all part of a continuity. I mean, most yeah. of our human lives, what are we here? Maybe 90 years, 80 years, maybe 100, I don't yeah. know, it's changing. But that's such a short time. It is. And if you don't have the continuity with the people that came before you, you can call this culture, yeah. then you're going to get kind of self-obsessed and not realize that your job is to take something that's been given to you and pass it on better yeah. to someone that's come yeah. you know it's a relay it's not it's not about you and i think when you take us away from that deep connection with place and there are a lot of us in the world like this now where we can be anywhere we want any day of the week and mm -hmm. you know we've got people have homes 20 homes it's yep. kind of crazy i think that yep. the relationship gets broken yep. to place and then we lose our sense of who we are we we think we're we become too arrogant, yeah. I think, and we lose our sense of the beauty and the, the loveliness of responsibility to a place. So we need to build our economy um, in Canada and around the world, probably in different ways. And, you know, it, 
it frightens me sometimes to hear that people need to make 15, 20, 30 percent uh, returns. Um, I think we, we've got ourselves into, you know, um, uh, an environment that, again, there are winners and there are losers. And it's a winner take all. And it's a winner take all. So how do we, how do we grow? How do you see growing our country? How do you see it growing it in a sustainable way? I think just stop for stop. I actually made a proposal once at Art Basel that everybody who has more money than they need to f feed themselves and their families should take a whole year off from return. Yeah. Like don't even seek return for a whole year. So we can spend the year to think about what should we do with all this money that we have in the world and how we might Reality. deploy it differently. And I, I don't buy into this bigger, 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 bigger. Mm -hmm. I think we can build an economy that's made up of a lot more smaller players. Yeah. Um, so how do we change people's attitudes? How do we, uh, how do we change behavior? How do we, how do we yeah. drink red, uh, less Red Bull and, and take less Viagra? <laughs> yeah, we were talking about this on the weekend. There was a guy in the Telegraph who said, we need to uh, change our attitude so we have less Viagra, less Red Bull, more herbal tea and afternoon nap. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think it's for each and every person to think about themselves as an economic person. And what do you do with your money? Where are you spending your money? Back to economic nutrition. Yeah. Think about money's power to be a source of nutrition. Yeah. And if you're a business person and you therefore control more levers, perhaps than uh, someone who isn't in the business world or in influential positions in the business world, get up in the morning, look at the world and try to see it as whole. I think yeah. every successful business is going to become, if they're not already, a social business. Yeah, I do or, too. Or maybe I'll say it this way: yeah. not just for profit. Not just for profit. Yeah. I think I think that you know the the uh, sustainability and purpose I think are going to become much more uh, part of uh, of enterprise. Fred, can I ask one more question? Okay, one more. Um, how did you find the confidence to embark on your personal project? How did you do this? How did you get over? You, you know, you were in business. How did you get over your own fears? My greatest fear was that I was going to become part of the global elite that just wanders around the world not being responsible for anything. Yeah. That was my greatest fear because my father is not so long dead yeah. that he's not, like, still there talking. Yeah. And, uh, and he would say, I think, uh, good that you come a distance to figure out what happened to the fish, but what are you doing to make sure it doesn't happen again. And I, I always forget the happy news. The happy news is the cod, the fish, are coming back. So yeah. what are we going to do differently this time? Yeah, to bring it all back. And it's about economics. Yeah, it really is about economics. Um, what an inspiration it is to be with, uh, with Zita. She is, uh, thank God, we connected Newfoundland to the rest of our country because we've got such amazing <laughs> people that have come from that uh, island in, in Labrador. I, uh, I just want to, uh, to, to leave the thought of, you know, the islands, uh, you know, the, the similarities that we have in terms of where we've come from. And we've taken a very similar approach to how we've run our businesses. And, uh, and, and I stayed in business, and I continue to do that. But what you've done in Fogo Island, the contribution that you have made to that community, to that society, would never have been achieved without your father making that promise to you and the, and the challenge to you to make that happen. What a thrill it is to be on stage with you, Cedar Cobb. Thank you. Thank you. Sita, I also want to thank you for an enlightening and inspirational discussion this afternoon. Uh, your ideas and approaches are truly transformative. We've a lot to learn about social entrepreneurship and community economics from the success 
that you're enjoying through the SureFast Foundation. Your passion for community and your business experience have benefited not just Fogo Island, but rural communities across Canada at a time when a lot of rural communities are struggling. So it's no surprise that your model is being studied and replicated. The Foundation and Fogo Island initiatives are excellent case studies of the power of investing in the resilience of rural communities. Your approach to combining art, nature, and culture with business, combined with a lot of hard work and risk taking, hold important lessons for all of us. We want to wish you continued success for your future initiatives. Thank you. And Annette, thanks very much for being such a great friend to the Canadian Club and for doing such a masterful job of moderating the, today's discussion. And, and I think Zita may even be prepared to offer you Fogo Island citizenship. <laughs> this concludes our program today, which will be broadcast on Rogers TV in the days to come. We're grateful to Rogers TV and 680 News for their continuing promotion of Canadian Club events. I'd also like to thank MediaEvents.ca, Canada's online event space, and VVC for streamlining today's event. To learn more about the club, please visit us at CanadianClub.org. Thanks very much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you at another of our events in the near future. Have a wonderful afternoon.